Right. Welcome everyone to our session about framing open educational practices from a social justice perspective. Um, I'm Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo here in Egypt. And with me are Catherine and Reggie. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. I'm Catherine Cronin from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland. And good morning. I'm Rajiv Jangiani. I work at uh, Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia, Canada, and I'm coming to you this morning from the traditional unceded ancestral lands of the Squamish First Nation. And this workshop is based on an article that the three of us have co-authored, and I put the link to that in the chat in case folks want to check it out later. And we're going to ho hoping to sort of get us all going on thinking about the same concepts that are in that article. Um, but before we get started, um, how are you guys feeling today? I feel like with the pandemic that I, I always want to check on people. Um, some days are better than others. Some days we're more hopeful than others. And some days we're frazzled. So how are you feeling today? Can you tell us in the chat? Better than yesterday. Coffee plays a big role. I'm usually not a coffee drinker, and now I drink coffee and tea like three, four times a day. <laughs> if you've been in meetings all day, uh, take time to stretch. If it's your morning and you, if you need a minute to go get some coffee or tea, you can I think, take time to do that. Hi, Lillian. Hi, Karen. OK. All right, I'll move on from here. Um, just to let you know, these slides are Google Slides and they're open, I think, open for commenting um, over here. And you can keep that. And I think, I don't think we added them to the session on the OE Global site, but we can do that later um, in the day. And another question, um, what brings you to this session? What are you most interested in? Other than the fact that people love Catherine Ojeev and me, of course. Yeah. I'm seeing that a lot of people are in the document, so I guess that's a good sign that people were able to open it. So that's good. Social justice, how to make a OEP inclusive, college institute promoting social justice and OER. Um, here's see how to apply ideas to a slightly different context. Okay. Interest social justice and to reconnect with Catherine. I feel like there's always more listening to do. Yeah, always scratch the surface. I'm just going to move on because I need to mute myself because it's noisy around me. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay. Um, we added this, this, this beautiful quote at the start of the paper. It's um, at the start of the presentation, rather. It's from um, a paper called A Wake Up Call, Equity, Inequality, and COVID-19 Emergency and Remote Teaching and Learning. Uh, and it's written by uh, 15 South African scholars, uh, Laura Chernewich is the lead author. Um, and we included this because one of the things uh, Maha Rajiv and I spoke about in preparing for this was that we wrote this paper um, pretty much immediately prior to um, the COVID-19 um, crisis uh, emerging in our lives. So, you know, we intended it as a convergence of some of our respective work in the area of OEP with an explicit social justice focus. Um, we, were re we were wanting to respond and build on some really um, valuable work that we had encountered, which we'll share in the presentation. But of course, since then, since the paper was published, you know, all of our lives have just changed dramatically, and some of us more than others, of course. So, you know, we, we just wanted to recognize the fact that as people and parents and partners and daughters and sons and friends, um, our lives have changed so much, but also as students and teachers and agents of change in our institutions and perhaps in our communities. Um, we, we perhaps see clearer now the multiple and coexisting forms of inequality 
um, in higher education, certainly. So, you know, we're, we're sharing some thoughts that we wrote in the paper, but really we invite all of the, all of your interpretations of that, you know, in, for your own context, you know, wherever you find yourself. And we hope that really we can just expand the work today with you all. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Catherine. And just picking up on that, I think um, it's interesting uh, to me when you think about uh, the context in which this paper was written, of course, as Catherine rightly says, building on and converging a lot of our work and building on the work that we've really uh, love and admire from, from treasured colleagues. Uh, but in many ways over the last nine months, I think many of us across the world have witnessed uh, the growing importance, the growing urgency of questions around social justice, about equitable access, for example. And so in some sense, I think some of the conversations in here, uh, perhaps the context has become a little more apparent to, to folks for whom it was perhaps a little less apparent uh, some time ago uh, as, as through the COVID, crisis, I know institutions across the world have seen, uh, you know, in many cases, increases in the adoption of basic open educational resources. Uh, but of course, uh, even with the best of intentions, sometimes the, the use of free digital resources, uh, instead of addressing inequities, can end up exacerbating those very inequities. And so perhaps uh, this conversation, which needs to continue, uh, becomes a little more important. So this paper was really written uh, building on, on a, a, a few things. One is uh, with a desire to, uh, as it says, provide a more inclusive typology of, of uh, open educational practices. As many of you will know, and we'll talk about soon, uh, there are many different approaches. There have been many different approaches to try and understand and articulate what OEP exactly encapsulates. Uh, and this builds in part on work by Maha in uh, published in 2017, I think, uh, which talked about um, uh, three sort of typologies on the one hand. We'll look at content-centric to process-centric uh, in one uh, as one dimension uh, uh, or sort of a, a one axis. Uh, we'll look at teacher-centric to learner-centric as another sort of axis. Uh, and then, uh, of course, those that are primarily pedagogical to those that are primarily social justice focused. Uh, so, of course, people, again, enter this through a different lens, through a different uh, doorway, uh, with a different intention, perhaps. Uh, and then the other piece of work that we're building on uh, very explicitly is, of course, the important work of um, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter, the extraordinary paper which uh, Cheryl gave a keynote at OE Global last year uh, uh, in Milan about, um, uh, about a social justice framework for open educational resources, uh, building on that very much as well in which uh, they, they themselves built on Nancy Fraser's social justice framework, uh, which articulates economic, cultural, and political dimensions mm -hmm. along which you can evaluate uh, OE, open educational resources in this particular case. Uh, but it really sort of lays out a, 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 a lens, a framework by which you can understand that a particular resource in their case, and of course extending it to a practice in our case, uh, could be uh, neutral. It could be even negative in terms of the impact it has along one of those particular dimensions. Uh, but in many cases, it, it, we go in with the intention of positive benefits, we hope for benefits, but we often end up in the ameliorative, uh, 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 with an ameliorative benefit where it's positive, but it's not quite the same as truly being transformative, for example. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, how this shapes uh, open educational practices as well, but uh, certainly both Maha's work and uh, Cheryl and Henry's work are absolutely pivotal in leading us to this work. This is what we're planning to do in the workshop. We'll talk a little bit about um, different understandings of OEP and clarify a little bit more our model. And we're gonna to try to apply our model using a group annotation thing, which is hopefully gonna be an, a quick um, interactive activity. We'll give you a five minute break to stretch or get a drink. Um, and then we hope to do a more interaction in breakout rooms where you take a particular open educational practice and you analyze it with the model um, and then we share back to the larger group and we're hoping that what comes out of that is something that we can do something with together afterwards. Uh, so for, for the first part, we're all together in the, in the same room, inshallah, first hour or so. Um, so I wanna ask you in the chat to say how you understand OEP and then we'll share. Uh, you can either define open educational practices or open pedagogy or just write key terms that come to your mind um, when we talk about this just before um, Catherine and I just take us through a set of existing definitions that are out there.
students as creators rather than consumers of content, letting students take over in various ways. Thinking of every person as a collaborator and co-creator. Every person is a nice, uh, it's very nice one. New to the topic, sure, welcome. Everyone is creators, okay. It's very interesting that that's the focus. Uh, everyone has a similar focus in terms of like who's creating. That's, that's a really good one to start off with. Okay. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay. Um, the, we just have a few slides here with some of the key definitions that we used as really kind of just foundation stones for, 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 for acknowledging and um, building on in, in terms of our own paper. So one is a definition um, of my own, which is fairly simple. And that is just that um, OEP is a broad descriptor of practices that includes the creation, use and reuse of OER, as well as open pedagogies and open sharing of teaching practices. Um, and that is the, the kind of, I suppose, the subtext of this definition is that um, OEP, in my experience and in my research, is always um, inclusive of OER, but goes beyond um, even the use, creation and reuse of OER, um, and includes open pedagogies and open sharing of teaching practices. So um, we often say that open pedagogy is included in the umbrella of OEP. So for those of you who, who, who are practitioners of open pedagogy, it, it's included in this maybe broader umbrella of, of um, OEP. You know, I have had um, colleagues say to me sometimes that they didn't feel um, that OEP includes their work, um, you know, if they're not currently teaching, but they're working, say, in, um, you know, supporting colleagues or so on, or so, so on, or reflecting on their own practice. Um, <clears throat> we very much um, central to our work was this particular definition um, of, from Cheryl and Henry, uh, as Rajiv has already mentioned, that OEP um, that undergird OER are individual and collaborative. And here, the, you know, Cheryl and Henry are really specific about um, the creation, retention, and distribution of OER through, and they specify the practices, open pedagogies, crowdsourcing, open peer review, um, and the use of open technologies. Um, and again, we'll say more about this paper because this was central really to our entire the thesis for this paper. But um, I just want to acknowledge the work that um, both Henry and, and Cheryl did here. Thank you, Catherine. And, and moving from a couple of those really important definitions of OEP to, to another term, uh, open pedagogy, uh, that of course it is, is perhaps even looser and, and, and even more understandings of this. Uh, here's one that, that Robin and I have been playing with. And I think in some sense, I'm seeing the reflections of uh, people's, some of many of the comments in the chat in this as well. We're sort of pointing to two different things. On the one hand, uh, the sort of the intention is what you can see is the access oriented commitment to learner driven education on the one hand, but also understanding open pedagogy as a process of designing architectures and using tools for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. Uh, and of course, this is, uh, this is a definition or an un one understanding of it that we um, uh, that we've placed on the open pedagogy notebook in part because it reflects a lot of the work around renewable assignments on the one hand uh, that are perhaps narrow and more specific, uh, but then more broadly uh, sort of the, the agency that's coming through in Stacy's uh, comment in the chat as well. Um, but as, as that is one approach, I uh, also want to point to yet another treasured colleague, uh, Sarah Lambert uh, from Australia, who in her very, very uh, helpful, important uh, work over here defines um, defines this as, uh, uh, defines open education as the development of free digitally enabled learning materials and experiences, primarily by and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalized in their global context. And so you'll see the very sort of explicit focus on, on, on social justice in uh, Sarah's definition. And in part, this comes from, uh, she's sort of harking back to, I mean, she reviews many, many definitions of uh, open education OEP, uh, but harks back to the 2002 uh, uh, declaration around open educational resources by UNESCO, which really talked about it being uh, uh, for the benefit of those who are marginalized uh, in some ways. Uh, and so 
this phrase of by and for non-privileged learners maintains that original intention as, as Sarah lays out. Um, and really the active participation by developing countries and the marginalized, rather than what we sometimes see is the sort of neo-colonial practices of the global north doing things to and for uh, those that they consider disadvantaged. And I'm quoting directly from Sarah's paper over there, which I really encourage you to read. She's doing extraordinary work. Okay. And so um, one of the things that I think was important for us uh, was to build on this typology here. And I developed this typology originally to talk about open pedagogy, but it also applies to open educational practices. So in our paper, we're using it for open educational practices. One of the things that I think was happening early on with open pedagogy is people trying to define it in non-inclusive ways in order to not be anything about anything, right? But I didn't think that it was anything about anything because there are certain themes within open educational practices that they have in common, even though they may be different across different axes. Um, and this typology is supposed to also help us look at different OAPs and say, oh, these ones are similar in that, and these ones are different in that, but they all have undergirding openness in different ways. So um, Rajiv kind of mentioned these briefly earlier, is that OEP can be more content-centric or more process-centric. You know, the ones that are very, very focused on OER may be more content-centric, but others like open pedagogy often may have nothing to do with OER, but maybe about the way we interact on the open web, for example. It can also be more teacher centric or learner centric because if a teacher is choosing the open textbooks then it's just a teacher using content that is open but the learners themselves are not like what all of you were saying in terms of learners co-creating knowledge there's some open practices that are not about learner agency right but you could do them with learner agency i don't think one is good or bad it's just that we have to recognize that some open practices don't give learners agency um, and then this one is really important to us, I think, because sometimes people talk about open as if it automatically means social justice is happening, but it doesn't. Something can be a good pedagogical practice. It may be empowering for all the learners in your classroom, but if those learners are either all from the dominant group or are mixed, but you don't uh, give more power to those who are marginalized, then it's a good pedagogical practice, but it may not necessarily be promoting social justice. Or, uh, and then within the pedagogical frame, something that's not in our paper, but we're realizing is really important during the pandemic, to recognize that the pedagogical includes cognitive, behavioral, and affective aspects. And a lot of people who don't know e-learning in the way most of us do, who don't know about the community of inquiry model, who don't recognize that social and emotional learning can happen online. A lot of professors in our universities are focused on the cognitive learning, and they're completely ignoring the affective aspects. Um, and that's also an important part of the pedagogical, right? And, it, and when there is no social justice, the need for the affective becomes stronger because students have more, more affective needs, right? Um, and on the social justice front, we're gonna explain uh, the model a little bit more, um, Nancy Fraser's model of economic, cultural, and political, because again, social justice has all these different dimensions and again, a lot of, of open uh, practices were focused on the economic only and sometimes in an ameliorative way that only fixes a problem one at a time rather than in a transformative way that fixes it on a systemic level. Um, and again, this neutrality and negativity can happen for one group over another. Um, and so we're also gonna talk about, other than the economic aspect, we're gonna talk about the cultural and political. Again, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter applied this uh, to their model for open educational practices that relate to creating OERs, whereas our paper is taking it to open educational practices beyond the ones that um, work directly with OER. Um, and so um, who wants to say the first one? I wanna say the last one, is that okay? <laughs> Rajiv, you go. Sure, and, and I guess before diving into these, you can see the, the dimensions within Nancy Fraser's uh, framework. Uh, I'm again just going to quote from, uh, from her work over here, because she <laughs> conceives of social justice as parity of participation, uh, right? So it's two things, as both an outcome where all the relevant social actors participate as peers in social life, but also as a process in which procedural standards are followed in fair and, and open processes of, of deliberation, as she writes. So uh, I think where it's really helpful, again, is in distinguishing between responses to these injustices that are uh, perhaps um, 
uh, as we'll see, sort of merely affirmative or ameliorative, and those that are truly transformative. So on the economic dimension, for example, uh, reducing the cost, let's say, of, of education by uh, adopting open textbooks, just to talk about OER for a moment, um, in place of commercial textbooks is a positive, right? But if ameliorative response, uh, I think, in this model, but transformative responses would do more to address the root causes of economic inequality, such as, you know, providing stable power supply, adequate access to functional computing devices, affordable, stable connectivity in rural areas, government or institutional funding to, to, to create and adapt and disseminate OER. So it would be deeper uh, in a way. So it's, uh, uh, so it's, uh, so over here, as you can see on the slide, it's really about giving access to those who could not otherwise access the learning experience. Uh, but if you leave the experience unchanged, uh, that's not quite the same thing. So that's, uh, that's the first. And I think, uh, Catherine, over to you. Yeah. Actually, Rajiv, if you want to give another example of cultural, and then I'll just come in with something just at the end of, of sure. Okay. Yeah, um, and yeah, and so I think over here, um, economic. Uh, maybe just the, the one thing I'll say is when we talk about economic injustice, it's maybe useful to talk think about it in terms of economic maldistribution as the injustice we're trying to tackle. On the cultural dimension, it's often about cultural misrecognition, uh, is what uh, Cheryl and Henry write about. Um, and so on the cultural dimension, uh, you know, one could use OER and do harm. I, one example that's a, a sort of a North American example, uh, and so it's easy for me to reach for, is when there was a, a early on, there was an astronomy open textbook that was published as wonderful open textbook for, for the North American context. And it was, oh, great, we've solved that. Let's move on to, to fill another gap in a way I was like, hold on the sky might look a little bit different from the Southern Hemisphere. And so this book is, it's another way of sort of, it's a very simple way of sort of understanding that, no, 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 not quite, not quite the same thing. And so, you know, we can look at translating OER into local languages as a step towards an ameliorative response, for example, uh, towards better cultural uh, uh, recognition. But again, a truly transformative response, I think would include remixing OER uh, to uh, remixing we are critically to engage with and challenge as uh, Cheryl and Henry Wright uh, hegemonic perspectives. Um, on the, I don't know what you wanted to say, Kathy, because I think Rajiv covered the cultural. Shall I cover the political and then you can comment after that? Is that all right? So, um, so beyond recognizing the perspectives of minorities and marginalized groups, the political injustice is about involving those normally without access in the redesign and going back to that aspect of parity of participation um, that Rajiv mentioned earlier. And this parity of participation is about not including minorities, but giving them the power to shape everything from beginning to end. It's not about these are the rules, this is how you're going to get the funding, this is how you're going to spend it, now decide what you're going to do with it, but actually giving them the right to choose how they want to go about designing the entire process. And sometimes this means that funders need to give a lot of, uh, for example, funders need to give a lot of freedom to, to folks who are getting the money to decide where the priorities are, rather than what usually happens when funding comes from the north down to the south um, with directives of where to go and, and how to do it. And the other aspect of it is how do you empower those or how do you ensure that those making those decisions have the power not to reproduce internalized oppression so one of the things, for example, when you ask students, you give students the agency to create their own open textbook, is if students have to use material that is already openly accessible, that material may not represent indigenous viewpoints because it doesn't exist with those licenses right now. And so they will end up reproducing hegemonic white Western Northern perspectives because that's what's available to them. That's what they've been taught is the canon. That's what they've been taught is valuable knowledge. And so you need to reframe the entire conversation sometimes to achieve this uh, political justice, a reframing of this uh, parity and parity of rights. Yeah, thanks, Maha. I, I um, just wanted to to add that we know this is, you know, the frame, the way we use this framework is necessarily simple. You know, we re we reduce it, you know, to its simple elements, whereas you know there is so much complexity in Nancy Fraser's framework, obviously. 
Um, but what we found even through our own work and working through the examples as we wrote the paper was, was isolating each of these axes separately and considering them led to some aha moments, you know, just led to some productive conversations even amongst ourselves. So, you know, we just want to, to admit that, um, you know, that we are using it in a very simple way and there's much more complexity in the work itself. And also perhaps that, you know, many people acknowledge that the, the final element, which was the last one that Nancy Fraser added um, to her first two elements, um, has been acknowledged as perhaps the defining um, form of injustice um, today. And, and certainly many of the conversations we've had this year have been about that particular form of injustice. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm sorry about the, I don't think we, we meant it to be like this, but anyway, this one, this slide. All right. So um, for the next few parts, we're going to stop talking a lot. Oh, hi, Tanya. <laughs> um, we're going to stop talking at you and we're going to do a couple of interactive activities. So the first one will be going through some of these and going through the typology and asking you to use the Zoom annotation to say where you think they lie and then we're going to have a discussion about some of them. But also after the break, uh, we're asking you if you want to go and dig a little bit deeper into each of these and imagine how can you take this kind of open educational practice and move it towards more social justice. So the part before the break is about saying where it lies on the typology. And then after the break, it would be about how can we make these practices more socially just, what would we be doing? Um, and so what we're gonna ask you to do, we're, we're gonna come back to this list again later, is that if you're interested in talking about a particular one of these, if you could rename yourself on Zoom and put the number before your name, so for example, if I wanted to talk about MOOCs, I would rename myself and I would be for Mahabel. Um, and then that number at the beginning is gonna help me put you guys in breakout rooms together so that people who are in the same room can be talking about the same topic and we'll give you um, a Google form to fill so that we can sort of curate everything that comes out of it and come back to the room and discuss it. So yeah, so if you could rename yourself, if you don't know how Sorry, I'll jump in since Maha's uh, mic is off. Um, we also are creating a quiet room. So if you want to explore these ideas, but you're not particularly interested in going through a particular task related to any one of the first nine items, um, there'll just be a quiet room if you just want to, to hang out there. Um, you can put 11 if you want to stay in the main room. And we know some people have to leave early. So people, have, some people have already said that to us. So you can put, just put a 12 there and then we won't be worried that you forgot your, um, your number. And Maha Rajiv, do you want to say anything about 13 or 14? <laughs> oh, yeah, 13 or 14 is just if people want to talk about something different than the list, like if there may be a couple of people here who are working on a project together and they want to go off on their own and talk about it, uh, you can let us know and we'll create a room for you. So it'll, if, if you can't, if you don't know how to rename yourself, I could rename you. Um, any of the co-hosts can probably rename you. So I'm gonna go back once, um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and maybe Catherine or Rajiv can share screen for the next portion. Um, and then I'll, people who haven't renamed themselves but have written something in the chat, I will rename you. Again, renaming yourself is through the participants yeah. list. Uh, um, it's a right click or a, name. sorry, Maha. It's a right click or a control click on your name if you haven't renamed yourself before. So just um, mousing over your, your name on your image in Zoom um, and then kind of control click if you're on an Apple or a right click if you're on a, a Windows machine. And then you can actually edit your actual name because if they're in the chat, sometimes um, they get lost for us. But if you actually rename yourself in Zoom, it's, it's easier to do the um, breakout room allocation. Um, I saw that Jess suggested a 13th topic, structuring ways of learning physically. So I've added it to this slide and I'm going to add it to the later slides, um, Catherine, uh, in case people want to join that one. You can, you can rename yourself up to a point and then after the break, just settle on something. All right, uh, Catherine or Rajiv, one of you share the screen and I'll, I'll rename people who are missing. Thanks. Who are missing their name. Rajiv, are you okay to do that? I'm just having little um, connection difficulties here. I keep getting messages. For the next part, we're going to be using Zoom annotation. So as soon as Rajiv um, shares his screen, hopefully, um, 
Have you guys used Zoom, Zoom annotation before? It's once someone is sharing their screen, it says you are viewing this person's screen. Rajiv can't find the slides, I think. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I've got it. It's just my, my second monitor I had about 50 different things on top. I needed to find them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, here it comes, I think. So the Zoom annotation is really cute, actually. I really like it because we're seeing something else, Rajiv, though. You're going to see uh, at the top of your screen is going to say you're viewing Rajiv Jangani's screen. And then there's a view options um, and there's a little arrow. And then under that arrow, there's something called annotate. And within the annotation, there's something called a stamp, which you can put a star or a heart or a tick or something like that. Yes, I think, yeah, we've used it quite a few times. I like using it. <laughs> it's a cool way to pull people um, visually. So yeah, so when we do that, we're going to really quickly see if there's a lot of disagreement in the room as to where each thing lies, or if most people agree on the same thing. And then the more disagreement there is, the more likely we are to have a conversation about it and discuss why we mean things certain ways. You can see your Zoom screen. Oh, <laughs> never mind. I'll move you back over. Almost there. <laughs> Hang on. I may I have to just stop and reshare. Just a sec. Okay. But I'm really proud of this group because almost everyone renamed themselves. I am so proud. Like, really. This is maybe the first time I've had such a good. Uh... <laughs> yes, bravo, everyone. There is someone who's now number three and has no name. So that's a little bit worrying, but it's okay. All right. Yeah. So, student authored textbooks. Where would they lie? I think we need to, oh, sorry, we have to do this every time, but anyway. So now where do you think is, do you think this is more content centric or process centric as a practice? If you're on a laptop or a computer, you should be able to find the annotate the way I told you. If you're on, a, on an iPad or a phone, it's, it's gonna look like a little pencil icon, but then you won't find the stamp option. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the stamp option so you can see what it looks like, like this. Hey, if I'm gonna erase my stamp, I wanna put it here. Oh. And is it more teacher centric or more learner centric? It's okay, we can keep going. Or maybe we can just go, yeah, all the way. So where'd you guys find it? Oh, you can't seem to be able to annotate. Oh, wait, let me see mm. if that's something that I've, I have to turn on. Oh, no, don't tell me. Yeah, oh, no. So probably the settings. We forgot to tell the open, the OE global people. Yeah, mine keeps disappearing, too. I keep creating one. And I'm the host. <laughs> and mine keeps disappearing. That's very strange. Mm. Mm. So you're putting Curious. one, but then it's disappearing. Oh. What about if you used, can you use the, um, the um, arrow or the, can you do this one? You found it? What's going on? Oh, yes. That seems I'm to seeing... work. Okay. I'm seeing. It's still arrow. sort of jumping around. <laughs> yeah, well, it's different people putting it. So most people are in the process centric side of this one. Mm. What about the learner versus teacher centric? Some people are saying content centric. So would someone like to explain how they were? Okay, let's not, okay, forget about the annotation. Maybe one person can talk about it and then others can say. <laughs> would someone like to say? Hi, so maybe I can talk a little bit about- yeah, um, thanks, Glenda. Um, so we, in Cape Town, we have a digital open textbooks project um, at the moment. And uh, we have been approaching this project through a social justice lens. So even when we selected grantees, we um, had criteria around the grantees considering uh, curriculum transformation and student inclusion in processes around the textbook. We didn't specify how students should be included. So just to focus on the student authored. And it's extremely interesting how uh, people have uh, two examples where the pedagogy was completely changed 
to include students as content creators in their textbooks. But what we also found, which is interesting, is that students were used uh, for quality assurance. So mm. there was a lot of feedback from students. So um, authors would, would let students read a chapter and, and get their opinions from them um, through surveys or through interviews. So that's kind of an interesting um, aspect that, that maybe to that process. So, so I would say it's in the content, certainly in the process of, of, of bringing students in. Um, so it's quite complex. Um, so if we had to talk about social justice and, and having it having a kind of more transformed approach, we would be then thinking about really these kinds of approaches where students are creating the content and giving feedback and drawing in more students. Um, and we have a couple of exemplars of this that are really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I, yeah, yeah learner-centric. And the pedagogical social justice, I'm not that sure that I understand the third thing that well. Oh, okay, um, so, so. Are you talking about a pedagogy, uh, the, the other, are you talking about pedagogy for social justice? No, because so I'm talking. Is it is it a good is it a good pedagogy that promotes learning versus it is a, is it a good pedagogy that promotes social justice? Okay, okay something okay. can be pedagogy can be empowering for students, but yes. not representing okay. marginalized views or involving marginalized students. So this is actually one of those things. And Glenda, thank you for for what you said, and I, I really enjoyed your session the other day. And and one of the things here is yeah yeah you we can all say that ten people are doing student authored textbooks, but some of them can be more process centric than others, giving students like you said more control, more um, more more things to do with it. And it's it is probably one of the things that's clearly learner centric. But then again, you can also make it more social justice oriented if you're giving students either from marginalized populations or trying to make sure that the resulting textbook represents uh, marginalized viewpoints, then you can orient it towards social justice more. And this is sort of what we're trying to think about here is that whatever the term student author textbook might mean in the in the abstract, what can we do to what would we do to make sure that it does more social justice work, uh, rather than just sound good that it's doing giving some learners some agency. Yeah, and can I just add, Emma, there's, we had some great debates even amongst ourselves and we, we, we took out every instance of the word versus in the paper because the although we're presenting these as kind of two endpoints is very much a continuum and um, it's, it's really a, about a tool for reflection for one's own practice. So, you know, if there's a way that you're um, conceptualizing to do something like a student authored textbook. This is just a way for you to think about it in a way that perhaps you may not have before. You may have been focused on other aspects of it. So, and and just simply by reflecting where you might fall on, on these various continua can help you think of other ways that you might be able to do it. And that's really all, all we found that the tool um, helps to enable. Uh, so really it's definitely not a binary, um, and, you know, it's not an either or. And, you know, in cases where it's both content and process centric, you might land yourself right in the center and then, you know, think about the fact, is that where I want to be, you know, or could I may maybe move it more one way or the other? So, so, you know, again, a reflective tool, really. Yeah. Does anybody want to make another comment about this particular one before we move on to another one? And we don't have to do all of them. We're going to do a few of them just as an example. Um, to help us think uh, before we move to the um, to the break and then the breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. I'll add one comment as well while, while folks are thinking, because I think part of the, the interesting thing working with uh, folks across institutions as people discover this kind of approach um, as well is, is I often find that, that sometimes people come in with a particular intention, a particular understanding of this would be really great for skill development for my students in this way. And it, it often doesn't, doesn't initially occur, for example, that this could be uh, designed or oriented uh, to serve, to support social justice. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's another way, right? It comes in because people are motivated. So it's often the starting point that people start to sort of realize additional possibilities and dimensions of. Um, but I think, yeah, it takes that intention and understanding in, in many cases uh, to, to, to do this deliberately and also to do it in a way that, that um, uh, 
you know, I, I think the framework helps to helps me as I think about uh, designing learning experiences, for example, that um, that weave things through intentionally instead of hoping, assuming, oh yes, it's a it's a it's an added bonus as opposed to no, no, this is the primary this is the primary goal over here. Right. One of the things that also Sarah Lambert talks about, I think, in her work is you know empowerment in and of itself or giving agency in itself in and of itself does not promote social justice necessarily right and that's important to think about but there are also instances where it's okay that you have a, you know a bunch of dominant learners and you're going to model to them participatory approaches so if you're a teacher educator if you're a teacher educator then your your teachers may all be white for example but modeling participatory approaches to them so that they can then apply them with their learners that you've still got a purpose there. It's just not directly the social justice purpose in that particular context, in that setting, you know, but it's, it's helping them become more aware of something. So it may be that you can't, in, in a particular context, it's okay that that's your limit, but you just need to recognize that limit and be explicit about it. Okay, Wikipedia editing. This is one of my favorite ones. Let's have some oral discussion around it since the... Okay, so we have some stuff here already. Okay, I'm seeing several people in the document who would like to share out loud or in the chat, of course, you can also share in the chat. Come on, you're not a quiet group. You very, are you thinking really deeply? It's one of those things like you don't, or did my internet connection go down? <laughs> I, uh, this is Tanya, I'll say something. I, you know, both of these examples, I think, I'm just thinking about, you know, when I think about social justice, I really think about action and, and you know, the, the process of, of creating an action is very different than the process of creating either a wicked, you know, the, a, a content, whether that content's a Wikipedia page or a textbook. Um, and, and I, sorry, I'm thinking, you know, you guys are generating a lot of thoughts. So this is definitely not a fully coherent thought at this point, but I, you know, I'm uh, just thinking more about like how, I talk a lot about entanglements, right? How do we get people out in the world and bring the world in? And, and I'm not, you know, so all of these pieces, I mean, to me still feel like we're on the content side, maybe learner centric, maybe, but still teacher, cause it's my, what do I want my students to do? And on the pedagogical side, and you know, I think for me it's about how do we how do we leap across into into that action um, action focused kinds of things, and how do we get our students there wherever there is? I loved your use of the term entanglements, and this uh, you know this, uh, and you're also putting them out into the world in a pretty tricky place. There's a few comments in the chat about this, like Jess Nip Jess O'Reilly saying. Um, the, the students got blocked from Wikipedia because of, I think there's, if you start doing this kind of thing without having a Wikipedia editor involved in helping you out, that kind of thing can happen. Um, Michelle, I see your hand. I'm just going to read out a couple of things and then I'd love to hear from you. Um, and then Francis is talking about marginal voices and content critique and process can be used to silence. Alternative process can be used to subvert inherent power play. And if you've tried to edit certain things in Wikipedia or create a new by a biography account um, and you've had it deleted before this has happened to me uh, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, it's not a very democratic process in this in that sense it's, it's a way to preserve quality but who decided what the standards of quality are mm -hmm. is, is kind of problematic and caroline is talking about representation and imbalance within the wikipedia community of mostly white men being the editors and things like that rajiv you wanted to say something and michelle had her hand up as well 
Yeah, uh, just briefly, I mean, I think you're right in, in talking about who uh, who tends to be the, the editors, moderators in Wikipedia is a good example of where this is a, a type of approach, a type of um, exercise where the, the platform, the, 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 the context is already so skewed in so many ways in terms of, uh, and that's why, you know, you see so many Wikipedia editathons, for example, that are intentionally designed to, to serve social justice by looking at representation of, let's say, uh, women scientists uh, are, and biographies about them it is one example of one that I see fairly frequently. Um, but I think the, the sort of, uh, not that any platform is neutral, but Wikipedia is particularly, obviously not neutral, perhaps. Um, uh, but, but also, I think that the guidance that comes from groups like the Wiki Education um, uh, Foundation, for example, uh, can often point people to a starting point or an approach that, that leads people to start in a particular direction. Uh, but I, I think the concerns that are being raised are, are very, very true. Michelle, do you want to go? Yeah, I was just going to share one of my uh, favorite examples from Wikipedia that I think is a nice illustration of what's possible with this. Uh, Olivia Banner, who is a faculty member or was, I, I'm not quite sure where she is now, um, but she she presented at UTA on uh, a Wiki, Wikipedia project that she did in her disability studies course. And um, the way that it played out was essentially the students had a, a very difficult time getting changes made to the Wikipedia article that they were working on and ended up kind of grouping together um, to make one very minor change or just one sentence is what they were able to eventually change. But it was a big change um, because it changed. Thank you, Rajiv. It changed um, or introduced the concept that uh, disability is very much approached, especially in the United States, um, from a medical model. And so it was really opening up that conversation about the, the social ramifications of disability and how we approach those conversations. And so the students really got excited that even though it was just one, you know, tiny sentence at the end of a paragraph, they were able to introduce this um, concept into the discussion. Thanks for sharing that, Michelle. And it's, it's good that they were able to do that because I know sometimes the, the discussions in the back end don't end up, uh, of course, that with a happy ending, <laughs> like people get pushed out. There was someone who was telling me recently that they are a neurologist trying to update uh, something about Alzheimer's or dementia or something. And there were people less credible than himself pushing out the very credible sources. So this is not even, this is we're not even talking about that he's trying to bring like non traditional knowledge into a space. He was bringing pretty credible, generally accepted knowledge and he was still pushed out by editors of that page. So that can also happen. Thanks for sharing the, the link, Michelle. Do, I, do we want to do one more and then take a break? Oh, you are already on the next one collaborative annotation. Awesome. I find this one a really, it's not quite a contrast per se, but it's a, it's nice to juxtapose this alongside the Wikipedia editing, because often, I mean, this is very explicitly writing in the margins, right? So these are, uh, it allows for more comments from the marginalized at the same time, uh, but it has its own dynamic as well. You can see this wielded in fairly subversive ways. I know a very popular assignment in some high schools uh, was when uh, students learning about political studies in the United States were furiously annotating anything that was put up on whitehouse.gov over the last four years. Very interesting public service exercise. So do folks have um, experiences of seeing collaborative annotation, whether 
I don't know if folks have experience with like hypothesis, but there are other tools that you can use to annotate things on the web uh, collaboratively where other people can see it. You can do it either publicly or with, um, with a small group, private group. And have you seen it done that is in ways that are just pedagogical or more socially just? Bye, Michelle, it's great to have you. Uh, I had a kind of fascinating experience with this one once. Um, I was doing a workshop with a bunch of people from a museum who were trying to put together the info architecture for a complex website. And they were all doing it individually first so that we could then bring the pieces together. And there was one um, young woman who had a notebook in front of her and she kept sighing and she was sort of frustrated, it was clear. And finally she said, you know, can I stop and use the board that's in the room, the chalkboard? I said, of course, you know, she said, um, I asked her why and she said, the, the space on the page was just too small, that she wasn't able to work within the physical space and show the interconnections and the, um, the cross-pollination of some of the ideas, the complexity of the info architecture. So she went to the board um, and as soon as she did that, everybody else put their pencils down and pens down and watched. And it was this fascinating moment where I, I sort of was realizing the primacy of the, of the physical chalkboard. It takes, it takes the priority of anything else in the room. And as soon as she started writing on that, it became a watching activity. Um, but then we, we shifted and, and pivoted to incorporating everybody's ideas on that board. But it was this sort of fascinating moment where the physical comes in and um, fundamentally changes the way that the interactional can happen. Um, that's a fascinating example, Jess, and just kind of how um, unintentionally in that example of how, you know, the power of just the media in that, in that case um, plays a role uh, and impacts what you're doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm trying to follow along the chat and just the examples and the discussions going on are really, you know, just a, a demonstration of just the kinds of things that we hope that just these, you know, admittedly simplistic um, characterizations um, facilitate. And, you know, I think we've all been, perhaps ourselves or seen colleagues say, you know, oh, I'm going to do this thing, you know, this open educational practice, collaborative annotation or editing Wikipedia. I mean, I know I did it myself when I first did editing Wikipedia with students, you know, many years ago. Um, I thought because doing this thing was going to be open and wonderful and so on, but but lifting the hood and, and thinking about these various parameters of how it's going to be open and to whom it will be open and what that means for those individuals to be open, I think really helps us to, to practice open more critically. So I'm really, I just want to say thank you for all the examples and, and comments and um, I think it probably is a good time, Maha, maybe to, to finish the conversation here. If anyone has any final comments for a short break and then, you know, everyone can work in their, in their own areas that they've chosen. So we've got everyone has um, renamed, so that's good. I'm just gonna, can I have one last comment if someone has, and then Rajiv, I'm gonna steal the sharing from you because I have that power. Oh yeah, the point, Rajiv, you're making in the chat, maybe you want to say that one out loud so it goes in the recording. Yeah, it's just to note that uh, I, I think this is where when Robin and I have always been thinking about this is, is, is the sort of the public element we've not always viewed as required for open educational practice. And, and part of that is uh, over here, you know, having things be private in particular, I mean, uh, to use an example, sometimes you know, mandating public participation doesn't just strip away students' agency, it can sometimes actively place them in danger. Uh, I give you concrete examples of place, you know, if, if there's a student who 
uh, has you know moved to escape an abusive relationship if there's a student who's undocumented in, in the United States requiring them to leave a public digital footprint is harmful uh, and so we may go in saying oh rah 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 let's do public scholarship in this way with students it's going to be socially just yeah no uh, real harm so the critical approach over here being especially important uh, and then of course you can come up with more technical examples of well if students are let's say creating ancillary ancillary instructional resources that are meant for instructors teaching a course uh, I have examples of where students have authored question banks, for example, and there are instructors who would love to use those question banks. Uh, but the student work is not public because instructors wouldn't use the question bank if it was publicly accessible. Yet it is collaborative, it is feeding into and surrounding an open resource. So I think, again, you know, we can get wrapped up in technicalities and there are very technical definitions available if you want that. Uh, but I don't think this is this space. Okay, let's... Um... Let's give folks a five minute break. I'm just gonna play this, it's a countdown timer, so you can keep looking at it to, <laughs> to see if you're coming back on time, okay? See you back in five. Okay, we just crossed the uh, break time. <laughs> so we put a slide for a quick activity. Uh, once we come back from the break, and we forgot forgot to decide on an activity. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe tell us one thing that's on your mind right now. That would be nice. I really appreciate um, open imperfection amongst highly respected presenter peers because <laughs> me deal with my own nervousness about presenting in a couple days. <laughs> That's good to know. I once messed up the breakout rooms in a session for faculty and I said to the and you know someone said to me it was good that you modeled messing up and recovering from that because that's probably going to happen to us. Because if you do everything perfectly, then people feel like they have to live up to that. And, that's, you know, and it's a certainty that sooner or later, the technology will fail while exactly, you're- Exactly, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so folks ready to go back? Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are back. So there are a few people who didn't rename themselves. That's not a problem. I'll move you, you know, I'll move everyone to breakout rooms when it's time to move. And then you guys uh, can tell me where you want to go. There is, um, a few, for some reason, oh yeah, there's a few breakout, a couple of breakout rooms that have just one person in them. So what I'll do is um, when we get there, um, I'll just let you know before I send you out that you're alone in a room so you don't get, um, and then you can decide if you want to stay there or go somewhere else. So before we send you to the breakout rooms, don't worry, we're going to tell you what you're going to do in the breakout rooms. We have a structured activity for that because I think sending people to breakout rooms without particular structure, if they don't know each other, can get really awkward. Um, so, so far we have room one has a lot of people, room two has a lot of people, room three has a couple, room six, Francis, you're on your own. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to go and maybe there's a few people who haven't chosen yet who are willing to go there. Room eight has some people. Room nine has one person, Marilyn, on her own, and then room 13 has a couple, which I'm really happy that um, Jess suggested the topic and you have a partner for that. Um, and so just letting people know, I and I've also done this feature, if you have the updated um, version of Zoom, you can move between breakout rooms yourself, so giving you agency to do that. So hopefully that's good. I'm just trying to figure out if this is the right form. So let me just check if this is the right link before <laughs> more imperfection. Just for you, Josh. Let's see if it works. Um, yay, it's the right one. All right, great. So um, Rajiv or Catherine, do you want to walk us through it? And I'll, I'll scroll. Go ahead, Rajiv. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, so uh, I think just looking at uh, 
at the, the screen that Maha is sharing. I mean, you'll see it's directly related to, to the framework we've been talking about. But, uh, you know, hopefully once you get into the room, spend a little bit of time uh, to make sure you understand who each other are. Um, uh, but uh, we would need one person from each uh, breakout room to, to serve as the sort of reporter entering uh, information into the forum, although you can all have the, the screen open on your own computers. Uh, you will have to settle on one specific uh, OEP, and of course you've already done that in some way, but uh, but sort of articulate the, the way in which you're envisioning that, uh, because you may be understanding that differently to, to start with. Uh, but then really uh, using uh, those uh, axes that we talked about, uh, and it's a little bit more of a scale than a binary over here, but of course, you know, we'd love to have it stretch out so it was a line and you could draw something. Google Forms doesn't quite give us that. that. But uh, articulating whether you think at the end of your discussion, uh, this OEP is more content centric, process centric, teacher centric, learner centric, uh, uh, primarily pedagogical focused or social justice focused. Uh, and then down from there, uh, uh, you'll see uh, a couple of additional questions. Uh, one is if it is pedagogical focused, uh, whether it is addressing one or more of the cognitive, behavioral, affective domains uh, in terms of the, the, the pedagogy. Uh, and then, of course, if it's social justice focused or more social justice focused, which of those dimensions? And it could be more than one, right? You can often address more than just the economic dimension. Um, uh, and then pushing it further uh, in terms of um, uh, whether it is uh, neutral, negative, ameliorative, or transformative as well down, down those dimensions. So um, hopefully you'll see this as a very direct reflection of, uh, of the framework that we've been talking about, but, but really digging in to see uh, where things are at. Uh, and then of course, further seeing how you could push this in a direction that would lead it to be more socially just instead of where it's starting from. So how could you tweak it? How could you deliberately orient it in a way uh, to make it more socially just? Even more imperfection. I love it. <laughs> Just, and this one is this one is there twice. There's a lot. There's a lot wrong with this form, but I'm fixing it right now. It's gonna be. Fun. This is so fun. This is, just reminds me of like you know sewing the costume at the last minute when you're in the wings waiting for the <laughs> curtain to go up. It's brilliant. It's exactly what you need to do. <laughs> okay, it should be good now. <laughs> if you discover something else wrong with it, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> And we should say that um, the idea of, of doing it in this way of a form, which might seem a bit of an arcane way to do this, just means that it will it will populate a big Google spreadsheet and that when all the groups come back, we'll, everyone will be able to just see what ideas everyone else came up with. So um, that's, that's the intention behind that design. Okay, folks. So any questions before we send you out? We're gonna send you out for 20 minutes and if you feel like We'll try to jump between the breakout rooms. So if you need more time, we'll uh, we'll we'll move you. Uh, Francis, I can move you to eight. And Maha, it's Lena. Am I going to stop? I'm going to stop the recording. I'm assuming for the breakout room. Oh yeah, that's a good portion. idea. Yes, yeah. Good. Otherwise, it's just a blank that's screen. A okay, that's a good idea. So folks, again, like I said, you can move yourselves if you have the latest version of Zoom, or you can come back to the main room. I'm going to be here most of the time. Uh, and I can move you to different rooms if you need to, if you find yourself unable to move yourself. And if you haven't renamed yourself, I'm here and I'll send you wherever you need to go. All right. Okay, so 20 minutes to begin with. And then if, if we feel like people need a little bit more time, we'll, uh, we'll increase the time a little bit. All right. How does one move oneself? 